Ah, the Azuri. One of the most graceful and dominant national teams in footballing history. With four World Cup titles and two European championships, who could oppose their stature? Look at those four beautiful stars atop that crest. Only Germany can boast as many, and just the mighty Brazil has a single star more. Okay, if I'm being completely honest here, there should really be only three stars floating above this shield, and to understand why this is the case, we have to go back in time almost 90 years to a completely different time in history. Welcome to Fascist Italy. The year is 1934, and Benito Mussolini is entering his 12th year in power as Prime Minister. Mussolini was the leader of the National Fascist Party from 1922 to 1943, and when he wasn't sending his political opposition to jail or aiding this guy in the war, he was thinking of ways to spread his propaganda. So, when the chance to host the second ever World's Cup presented itself, Mussolini jumped on the opportunity to spread his political ideology to the masses, as this was the first World's Cup to ever be broadcasted on radio. After a lengthy battle over who should host the tournament, Italy was chosen over Sweden to host the 1934 World Cup. Now, before the tournament even started, there were already some incredibly shady things going on behind the scenes. We're talking about literally stealing players away from other national teams here. You see, back then, the regulations about what teams a player could represent internationally were completely different. In fact, FIFA did not even have any official rules regarding the eligibility of international players. This meant that players could change national teams at their whim, regardless of how many times they had played for a country. Meaning that some pretty weird situations could occur, like what happened with Real Madrid legend Alfredo Di Stefano, who played for Argentina, Colombia, and Spain. That's three different national teams. Then there's his teammate Puskas, who put on the Hungarian jersey 85 times before switching to the Spanish national side. As well as Luis Monti, who played on this 1934 Italian national team after representing Argentina for seven years. In fact, Monti is the only player in history to ever play in two separate World Cup finals. But oh no, Monti was not the only player on this team to have previously represented another country at the highest level. You see, Mussolini was well known for encouraging and even convincing international players with Italian ancestry to change national sides, or as he put it, to defend the honor of the Italian nation. In total, 5 out of the 22-man squad had played for either Argentina or Brazil prior to joining Italy. They were referred to as Oriundi, which translates to imported Italians. Both Argentina and Brazil were well aware of Mussolini's exploits, and out of fear of losing even more of their top players, both countries decided to field the backup squads to play in the tournament. I am not joking. Look at these teams. Not one player had more than 4 caps. In Argentina, well, their entire squad had only five caps between them combined. Not to mention that four out of the 12 goals Italy scored were by players that Mussolini persuaded to join, one of them coming in the final by Raimundo Orsi. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Now, most people would say Mussolini swaying players to join Italy is a bit dubious, but it wasn't against the rules at the time, so what's the big deal here? Okay, that is a fair point. So. Let's move on to the actual football and talk about qualifying rounds. And yes, you did hear that correctly. Even though Italy were the host nation, they still needed to participate in qualification. 1934 was actually the first World Cup to introduce a qualifying stage to the tournament, although it was not at all like the one we are used to today. So the Azeri get a pretty easy matchup against Greece, a team who had only formed their national team four years prior and had won just one of their last 13 international games. They ended up beating them 4-0 at home at the San Siro, and this is where things start to get a bit odd. All the Azuri needed to do was travel to Athens to play the away fixture and not lose horribly, but instead, Greece just straight up forfeited from the tournament because as FIFA reported, they were discouraged by the heavy defeat. I mean, yeah, I get that, but you're not even going to try? And I know what you might be thinking. Greece was far from the only team to withdraw from the tournament. In fact, they were the fifth team to do so. But to this day, there are still so many questions left unanswered. Like, 
Why did the Greek Football Federation withdraw from the game after already selling over 20,000 tickets for the second leg? And why did the Italian FA compensate the Hellenic Football Association by gifting them a $400,000 house in Athens? Accounting for inflation? That's almost a $9 million gift in today's money. And yeah, I get it. Italy was up 4-0 in aggregate anyways. So at the end of the day, does any of this even matter? Well, if you really thought that this was all the evidence I had, you would be truly mistaken. I mean, why would I even make a video in the first place if it all just stopped here? And frankly, I have only just scratched the surface of the ridiculousness that occurred in 1934. And we haven't even talked about the knockout rounds yet. So let's get into it. Italy started off with a comfortable 7-1 win in their first round of 16 matchup against a USA squad who had just played their qualification match only three days before. And two goals from former Argentine international player Raimundo Orsi helped them move on to the quarterfinals where they faced a really strong Spanish side who had just beaten Brazil 3-1. This matchup against Spain would go down to be one of the most brutal and physical clashes in the history of the game with referee Luis Bayert letting many fouls go unpunished. Spain started strong with a goal by Luis Ruggiero in the first half. Italy then equalized a minute into the second half, much to the demise of the Spanish players, who were utterly baffled how their goalkeeper Zamora wasn't fouled in the build-up to the goal. If you look closely here, you can see that the Italian player Chavallo backs up into the goalkeeper, in turn giving Italy a vital equalizer to stay alive in the knockout rounds. Honestly, I think this was a pretty clear obstruction, and the goal should have been overturned. But, it was awarded to Ferrari, and the match went into extra time and remained tied after 120 minutes were played. At the time, the rules in place called for a replay, as penalty shootouts were not put in place until 1970. Following the match, there was a lot of talk about unfair referee decisions. And Gianni Barrera, an Italian football journalist, even wrote, The referee Bayard behaved as if he was well aware where the game was taking place. I mean, I'd be scared of Mussolini as well if I'm being honest. I can see the headlines in the paper the next day. FIFA official disappears after Italy knocked out of the tournament. The following day, the two teams met up again, but with almost completely different lineups, due to an incredible amount of injuries from the day before. 5 for the Italians and 7 for the Spaniards. The match started less than 24 hours after the 1-1 draw, and Italy's Miazza fired home a header in the 12th minute to put the Azzurri in front, and after having two goals disallowed for questionable offsides decisions, Spain were out. Not to mention the fact that at one point in the game, Spain were down to 8 players, as 3 of their players were injured. And substitutions were not part of the game until 1970, so if someone got injured, they had to leave the pitch entirely. Also, one of these injuries occurred in the fifth minute of the game after a Spanish player was taken down in the box, but no penalty was given and Italy advanced to the semi-final after winning 1-0, but not without controversy of course, as the official of the second game, Marseille, was suspended from the Swiss Association of Football for a quote, lousy performance. And as we go on, you will see that this is not an irregular occurrence. Austria, who were Italy's next opponents, were known as the Wunder Team because of their domination of the European game, losing just 3 out of 31 games from 1931 to 1934. In front of 35,000, on a San Siro pitch muddied by torrential downpour, Italy was able to muster a 1-0 win thanks to Guatia's rebound. Yet another important goal scored by an ex-Argentine national player. Alright, hold on. Let's backtrack for a second and watch that replay again. Alright, pause. How can you tell me that this is not a clear and obvious foul? The ball was in the keeper's hands when Miyazu kicked it out from his grasp. I mean, maybe we don't have a crisp, perfect angle of it, but in my experience, this gets called back practically every single time. Still not convinced, you say? Okay, how about I tell you what our semi-final referee was up to the night before the game? You see, that night, Swedish official Ivan Eklund was invited to have dinner with the man himself. Just normal muscling things, of course. I mean, what were they possibly chatting about? The weather? 
You're right, Neymar. Yeah, it's only a This was some grade A bullshit, but nonetheless, Italy move on to the final of the World Cup, and there they were to play Czechoslovakia. So far, the political use of hosting a World Cup was doing wonders for promoting Mussolini's totalitarian regime. He wanted to show the world how organized and effective his fascist society could be. I mean, the stadium that would host the final was called Stadium of the National Fascist Party for Christ's sake. And a win in the final would be the cherry on top. The day before the game, Mussolini himself gave the team a personal pep talk saying, if the Czechs play fair, we'll play fair. That's the most important thing. But if they want to play dirty, then we Italians have to play dirtier. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Well, I'll tell you exactly what that means. Remember this guy? The referee that Mussolini had dinner with before the Austria match? Well, get this. He was chosen to officiate the final as well, in turn also making him the youngest person to this day to ever ref a World Cup final at the age of 29. For me personally, this is what made it 100% crystal clear that there was a genuine conspiracy going on behind the scenes. If you take into consideration the blatant influence Mussolini had on the officials and then combine it with the stealing of players and the bribing of football associations, I think what happened in 1934 has got to be one of the most obvious examples of corruption in the history of sports. Italy then went on to lift the title after coming from behind to win 2-1 in extra time thanks to a goal from yet another ex-Argentine national team player, Raimundo Orsi. And surprise, surprise, the Czechoslovakians were not happy with some of the referee's decisions. What a shocker. At the end of the day, Mussolini didn't even care about football. In fact, he was even recorded as describing football as unmanly and preferred a different version of the sport called Calcio Fiorentino, which was an early version of football and rugby that originated during the Middle Ages in Italy, where players would enter in hand-to-hand -hand combat in order to get down the field to score. Frankly, to me, this just illustrates the mindset of a man like Mussolini, who was purely power-hungry and would do anything in order to get what he wanted, including bribing and scheming his way through a World Cup. Ultimately, it was the actions of dictators like Mussolini that led to the abandonment altogether of the World Cup for a lengthy 12 years because of World War II, and it wasn't until 1950 that the world was ready again to participate on the beautiful stage that is the World Cup.